So our first speaker today will be William McCants. Um, actually, one of the things that I discovered in putting this conference together, I first went to the people I knew were scholars of the topic and then discovered that most of the people who are doing serious work on this topic are in fact um, uh, working in think tanks and not in academia. So uh, William McCants is a fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy and director of the project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world. He's also an adjunct faculty member at Johns Hopkins University and has served in government and think tank positions related to Islam, the Middle East, and terrorism, including the State Department senior advisor for countering violent extremism. And he is at the Brookings Institute. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Richard, very much for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, hearing Richard's talk, now I'm, I'm worried to be writing a book on ISIS and the apocalypse. It sounds like nobody's going to read the thing, nobody's going to review it, it's just going to be shunned. Um, but what I wanted to share with you this morning uh, is some of my research, um, particularly about uh, what I think is an interesting shift in the Islamic State's apocalypticism. Um, I, I, given that the book is primarily about its views of the apocalypse, I tried to map those views over its entire history from its founding in 2006 um, until the present day. Um, there's no question that the group is apocalyptic. I mean, they use a lot of apocalyptic uh, rhetoric in their propaganda. Uh, they use it as a recruiting tool, they always have, but the kind of rhetoric they use and the sort of apocalyptic texts that they emphasize has shifted over time. And what I want to suggest to you today is that the shift in this rhetoric indicates an important shift in its thinking about um, politics. Uh, so let me run you through some of the evidence, uh, give you my argument, and then we can talk about it later in the Q&A. Um, the question I was trying to wrestle with is, you know, is, is this group uh, apocalyptic in the urgent sort of sense of uh, apocalypticism? Do they believe that a, a messiah of some sort is going to become, come very soon and, and the end of the world is imminent just around the corner? Or is it the sort of apocalypticism that is more of the, the kingdom come, um, there's going to be a millennium, uh, and then the world is going to end in fire and brimstone. And, and what I want to argue today is that um, it's, it's uh, somewhere in between. But that shift has occurred over time. When you look at the history of the first Islamic State, so I make a distinction between the first and the second, the first one being 2006 to 2010, when its first emir was killed, uh, and then the second one being when the new guy, the current emir, so-called Caliph Ibrahim, uh, was selected as emir. Uh, if you look at the, the first iteration of the Islamic State, um, most people, when they're trying to explain why that Islamic State failed, and it did largely fail uh, by 2008, they would point to a variety of factors. Um, that the Islamic State was uh, arrogant and, and violent in its treatment of other uh, insurgent groups, um, that it was brutal uh, in its treatment of uh, the Sunni population who it also turned to for support. Um, and uh, that it just, in general, uh, governed and it had an authoritarian style uh, in, its, in its conduct that basically alienated any potential fellow travelers, partners, or population that would have worked with it. Um, and I think that's about right. But there is a, there's a hidden dimension here that, that people don't know about because, um, because it hasn't been brought to light before. And that dimension is an apocalyptic dimension. Um, uh, I found a document uh, written by the Islamic State's first chief judge uh, who got fed up with the organization and left. And he wrote a letter uh, to Al-Qaeda's leaders 
uh, uh, airing the Islamic State's dirty laundry. He says, this is what's going on on the inside, and here's what you need to be worried about, and please do something about this. And among the charges, and, and many of them have to do with this arrogant style, the abuse of uh, other rebel groups, so on and so forth. But among the, the laundry list, there, there is an interesting part of this letter where he talks about uh, the uh, apocalypticism of the group's leaders. Uh, in particular, the founder of the Islamic State, Abu Ayyub al-Masri. Um, Masri was uh, appointed or declared the, the minister of war of the Islamic State, but he actually ran the organization, particularly in the early years. Um, and it turns out, at least according to this chief judge, that he was uh, extremely uh, apocalyptic uh, in his thinking. This judge charges uh, that Masri believed that the Mahdi would come any day. Uh, he ordered his men to begin build, building pulpits uh, for the Mahdi or the Muslim savior to ascend uh, in the Prophet's mosque, uh, in the Umayyad mosque, and in the Aqsa mosque. Um, he also told his, uh, his commanders that the, uh, the state of Iraq uh, would be uh, would be conquered, the, the land of Iraq would be conquered within three months. And he ordered his commanders to fan out over the entire country uh, to begin the conquest. And according to the chief judge, when the conquest didn't come within a few weeks, Masri had to recall his commanders because they were taking major uh, military uh, losses. If you look at the Islamic State's pro public propaganda around this uh, same time, you will see it's, it's not quite so uh, apocalyptic, but it's close. They focus a lot on the black flag that the, they will hand. They will be the ones that will hand this black flag to the Mahdi uh, when he appears. Um, and there is a really interesting reference uh, in a 2007 declaration by the nominal head of the Islamic State, um, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, uh, where he talks about his hope to lead the troops out of Iraq to go to Mecca uh, and to uh, fight in the vanguard of the Mahdi, who will be clinging to the curtains of the Kaaba. Uh, which is the chief shrine in Mecca. And David is nodding because David, David has uh, been the one that's sort of excavated the more of, of obscure apocalyptic references. And this is an obscure one. Uh, it's the, it's, it comes from a prophecy uh, that is found in um, uh, uh, Noam bin Hamad's book, um, The Book of Tribulations or Fitan. Um, and uh, it's, it's curious for a number of reasons, one of which is that the, the, this particular prophecy uh, has to do um, with the Mahdi not wanting to lead the Muslims and, and the people that are gathering around him threaten him with beheading and then he's like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. Um, uh, and it's also interesting because the collection in which it's found, this particular book, um, a lot of Salafi jihadists don't care for the book uh, because they consider many of the prophecies in it to be spurious. Um, and it's unusual, uh, particularly when compared to contemporary Islamic State propaganda, um, it's unusual to find this kind of reference. Contemporary Islamic State propaganda about the apocalypse, so far as I've been able to determine, comes from uh, the canonical collections of Hadith. They do not pull it from this potentially rich resource of material um, in contrast to uh, the early Islamic State. So all of that to give you a sense that uh, the early Islamic State is much more focused on the eminent appearance of the Mahdi. Al-Qaeda receives this letter, and in fact, they meet with the chief judge face to face. They're horrified to hear that their affiliate in Iraq is engaging in this kind of thinking, particularly since they're making strategic decisions on its basis. And they write a letter back to the Islamic State and they say, knock it off. This is ridiculous. Nobody knows when the Mahdi's coming. You shouldn't be telling people otherwise. You definitely shouldn't be making decisions on its basis. This is no way to conduct a military campaign. So you can see right there 
um, uh, that the Islamic State's apocalypticism, particularly in its early variety, was quite different uh, from the sort of apocalyptic notions that Al-Qaeda's leaders may have entertained. Another point is that Masri, uh, when uh, considering the institution of the caliph, um, uh, didn't put much thought into it. It was not an institution he really um, uh, uh, emphasized. Um, particularly in private, when they made the selection of the first emir of the group, who they called the commander of the faithful, right, which is the title of the medieval caliph, um, when they picked the first guy, it would, they just plucked some guy practically off the street. It was someone who was low down in the ranks of jihadist organizations. Uh, I, I, uh, Islamic State insiders who have since come forward said, we had never heard of this guy. No one had ever heard of him. And it's not like the elevation of, say, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Um, uh, this particular fellow had no qualifications at all. He had been a police officer and the Saddam regime had fired him from his job because he had been uh, a Salafi. Um, and so no one had ever heard of him. And ap apparently, according to the chief judge, um, Masri is uh, pretty upfront and confiding with his, uh, some of his closer uh, lieutenants that this uh, that this guy had just been selected you know, from a group of people. And it just go, I mention it because it goes to show you that the early Islamic State did not really care about the office of the caliph. It, it wasn't something that they put much, much emphasis on. Contrast that to today. And I think the contrast is really stark. Um, today, in Islamic State propaganda, <clears throat> the Mahdi is barely mentioned. He doesn't come up hardly at all. And it's especially noteworthy that he doesn't come up in places uh, where he should come up. Uh, he is absent. Uh, for example, uh, when the Islamic State's uh, English propaganda magazine, Dabik, talks about um, going to Saudi Arabia and fulfilling prophecy and taking over Mecca and Medina, there is no mention of the Mahdi. And that is exactly the place where one would be talking about the Mahdi if you are an apocalyptic group. They're apocalyptic in so many other things. But in this, it is really striking that he is barely mentioned at all in their propaganda. <clears throat> also, in contrast to the early Islamic State, Look at where they put the emphasis, the apocalyptic emphasis in their propaganda. It is on the office of the caliphate. So they quote this particular prophecy about the early establishment of the caliphate, that it will disappear, it will be followed by a series of, of monarchies and tyrants, and that one day the caliphate will return, Muhammad falls silent, and many jihadists, uh, particularly the Islamic State, reads that silence as, this caliphate is going to come soon before Judgment Day. This is where they put their emphasis. And um, uh, in their texts about the caliph and about the, the reason the caliph has to come back, um, they quote another series of prophecies uh, that have to do with the appearance of 12 caliphs, particularly 12 just caliphs. And they argue that seven or six, it depends, of these have already appeared. And so there's a handful that are going to appear at the end of time when this caliphate is reestablished. They are going to descend from Muhammad's uh, son-in-law, Ali. They are going to bring justice uh, back to the world. The emphasis in their propaganda, quite clearly, uh, is on the institution of the caliphate. It is not on the person of the Muslim savior or the Mahdi. And this, I think, is a, 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 indicates a major shift in political thinking in the Islamic state, contrasting the first state to the second state. The second state much more focused on state building. Why did this shift occur? I'll tell you one reason uh, that I think we can dismiss uh, is that you know, some might say that, that you know, the, these prophecies of the Mahdi that the first Islamic State were using were unacceptable uh, because they're non-canonical and it just doesn't fit with the ethos of the contemporary Islamic State. 
I don't think that's quite right because there's plenty of Mahdist prophecies in the canonical collections. If you wanted to emphasize it, you certainly could. You, you're not bound by the less canonical traditions. So I, I don't think that explanation works. I've got some other explanations that I, I think get closer to the truth. One is that um, this is a matter of pure survival. Uh, the early Islamic State nearly destroyed itself partly because of this apocalyptic thinking, which is why Al-Qaeda's leaders told it to knock it off. And the current uh, emir slash caliph of the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, um, he was in the organization in this early period he would have seen the effect of this kind of thinking. We don't know what conclusion he might have drawn from it, but it's interesting to speculate that he may have believed that the group was going in uh, the wrong direction. So it's a matter of survival, first of all, this kind of shit. Secondly, um, as, as uh, Richard uh, mentioned, um, and I think it's worth bringing it to the fore, is that focusing on the caliph, these, these 12 caliphs, this handful that is yet to appear, focusing on them, um, it sustains the apocalyptic moment. Once the Mahdi appears, it's kind of all downhill from there, right? And it's going to be really bad for you if the Mahdi dies, like Cole is going to talk about later. Um, by shifting to the institution of the caliphate, not only do you... Uh, put your uh, organization on a firmer footing and help it survive longer, um, but you also get to prolong the moment in which you are motivating fighters to come join your force. And um, uh, as you probably have read in numerous press accounts, the, um, the apocalyptic stuff is particularly effective on foreign fighters. So the longer you can sustain that apocalyptic moment, by shifting to uh, uh, kingdom building rather than imminent appearance of Messiah, um, the more you're going to be able to keep drawing in recruits. Um, I, I think there's a third factor at work as well, and that is the, uh, the real opportunity to build a state. The first Islamic state, despite its name, never really had a bite at this apple. It never really controlled much territory. Given the current conflict in Syria and then in Iraq, um, the political opening, the disenfranchisement, disgruntlement of the Sunnis, uh, the fact that Assad was happy to allow the Islamic State to grow because it didn't represent a direct threat uh, to his rule because they were so focused on state building rather than trying to overthrow him, gave them an opportunity that would have been hard to ignore. So I think this was also part of this shift towards uh, uh, towards caliphate. Finally, I would say that the person of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi um, uh, gave more substance to the office. As I said, the previous emir was a nobody. He didn't really have the credentials. Look at the credentials that Baghdadi has. Um, none of these are, are uh, necessarily requirements in classical Islam for a caliph, but they definitely help your case. First of all is his lineage. Now, I've gone back and, and, and checked where I could. It seems that all members of uh, Ibrahim, Awad Ibrahim's tribe, and that's the current Baghdadi, all members of his tribe, uh, the Bubadri tribe around Samara, believe that they are descended from Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law. So his particular claim in this vein uh, is not necessarily outlandish. He was known to have this lineage. And as a side note, one of the fascinating things about this lineage is that they claim descent from uh, the brother of the 11th Imam, the brother who denied that there was a 12th Imam. So they get to claim a lineage from Muhammad while taking a shot at the Shia, if you know anything about 12 or Shiism. So one is the lineage, right? Gives more substance to it, fits neatly with the propaganda about a descendant of Ali reestablishing the caliphate. Um, also, uh, Baghdadi, the current Baghdadi's religious training. It turns out he has quite a lot of it. Um, he got his PhD from what was then called Saddam University, later Islamic University, 
in Quranic uh, recitation. Um, and uh, so he's no slouch in terms of his scholarly uh, credentials. Finally was his jihadist experience. Now I never got the sense that this was a guy that was carrying a rifle in the field, but it is the case that very early on after the US invasion of Iraq, he was involved in jihadist organizations. So he has a CV then of religious uh, uh, learning, uh, he has the lineage, and he has the militant experience that would round out, flesh out the figure of the caliph, whereas his predecessor uh, never had it. So I think for those four reasons then, uh, we see this shift from Mahdi to Caliphate. Finally, where does it go from here? Um, one direction it could go is it could continue in its current trajectory. And if it goes in its current trajectory, um, you would see over time, if they're able to hold on to the territory, establish a real state, you would see over time something akin to what happened under the Abbasids, with the Almohads, with the Fatimids, all of which were apocalyptic movements, and all of which successfully made this transition to states. They never quite gave up the apocalyptic language. They still used apocalyptic sounding names for themselves, but over time, they, you know, the, the eminence of the Day of Judgment got further and further and further away as they shifted more and more to state building. I think that's uh, um, uh, where the Islamic State is heading, given its current trajectory. But if it is stopped, if the Islamic State is defeated or its government disappears, uh, which I think is a pretty good bet, um, it may take a different trajectory. Uh, and that trajectory could be, as Richard said in his opening remarks, could be to double down on the apocalypticism. Um, if you look at the current schema that they've set up of these five just caliphs, Baghdadi is supposedly the first. If he dies, and he's reportedly very injured, if he dies, of course, he's going to be considered a just caliph, right? Because your propaganda is not going to work if, if he's just a caliph and not the just caliph. Um, and then you would expect that his four successors would have to be considered just as well uh, by his followers. And so the faster that the United States and its allies move through his successors, the more it might push them to uh, a more aggressive, if that can be imagined, uh, version of their current apocalypticism. Thank you. <laughs>